Hey guys, welcome to a TGS podcast slash video with Dan Reynolds from Basque. Thank welcome, you. mate. Thank you very much. Um, unless you've been hiding under a rock this last week, um, as of Monday morning, although there was plenty leaked about 48 hours beforehand uh, by the Gun Trade Association, amongst others. What's happened? So, uh, joint announcement across nine organisations on Monday, which is uh, calling for a voluntary transition away from lead and single-use plastic in shotgun ammunition for live quarry shooting. Okay, my first question of any of any sense actually is, can you explain voluntary? Yeah. Does voluntary mean that we have to do it and you have volunteered us all? No. Or so there will be no significant law, or is this like a it's voluntary till twenty twenty four, but by twenty twenty five they're going to ban it proper anyway, so we might as well get used to it. Uh, difficult to judge uh, in terms of what legislative impacts we might see, but voluntary means voluntary, um, and I think one of the feedbacks that I've been getting, you know, phone calls into our office or emails in, is that um, there is a ban on lead. Well, absolutely not the case. So it is a voluntary transition away over a phase period of five years. Um, this is an attempt at self-regulation, it, one presumes. A- absolutely, yes. because you only have to look at uh, Europe. So you look at the European Chemicals Agency and the European Commission, uh, mm-hmm. who have gone to and fro over... So European Chemicals Agency basically look at all types of toxic substance, um, and lead comes back onto the agenda in various guises. So we will have cynic out of petrol, paint, pipes, da 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 I can explain all that, uh, but ECHA have basically gone to European Commission and said, look, we believe that there are um, impacts of lead in the environment for wildlife and there are impacts of lead on human health in relation to uh, lead shot and lead ammunition. Um, here are the risks and the EC have gone, okay, we understand the risks now, European Chemicals Agency, you go away and prepare a restriction dossier. They they are in the process of preparing that dossier. That, if you look at the European Chemicals Agency timetable, will be with us in October this year. If you look at the timetable, the implementation of- Do you know what's in it? We don't know what's in it. But we are presuming that that will be anti-lead. Uh, absolutely, it will be looking at how they mitigate the risk of lead okay. in the environment and in and in food through use of lead shot, and they're also looking at um, uh, lead in sort of fishing tackle and, and weights and that yeah. sort of thing as, as part and parcel of the process. But come back to the point that in 2022 in Europe, whatever restrictions are in that dossier, once they've gone through a period of consultation, will become law. In will Europe. be put into legislation in Europe. So, um, and many people the thing say, is, it's very likely in Europe they will go led legally before or non-led legally before we will so actually we're extending our life beyond that of every european country Uh, potentially yeah so if for life quarry shooting with shotguns yeah so if we look at the way that uh europe are doing it it it, it will have an impact on all ammunition um or that is uh the suspicion that we're looking at so and you may say well that doesn't affect us we've gone through Brexit now, uh, sort of finally that's happened and by the end of the year, uh, you know, we would have gone through this transition period. Um, So two things on that, our government may turn around and say, actually, we like the look of that legislation. And by 2022, we could also potentially be involved in that anyway. Be looking at a way in which that, you know, there is a a ban, a legislative Mm -hmm. ban, which would be possibly very restrictive. Um, On the flip side, if they don't put a legislative ban in on this country, We've got to remember that what we shoot in terms of game, over 50%, somewhere in the 60% mark, is exported to Europe. And if it, they can't buy it, whilst I can't preempt what's going to be in the restriction dossier, if we are looking at a market that cannot take game which has been shot with lead, what do we do with that? So, uh, one of the questions wasn't really a question, it was more of a statement is why aren't you restrict? Why did you choose steel over quantity of pheasants? Um, because I think uh, if you look at the so the, the way that the um, game industry uh, game shooting industry is set up that is around uh, bags and pheasants per bag and that's what produces the income uh, and the income underpins employment it underpins conservation spend it underpins the social well-being element um, and it also underpins uh, the economic benefit and yeah. you as a gun shop will see that people coming to buy guns cartridges equipment all those sorts of things so once 
you make a decision if that if that is the binary choice of we go steel or we go um, uh, less bags for pheasants. Um, your all of those things that cascade out of that your economic benefit, your employment benefit, they start to shrink because your top tier way more people in. lose in that scenario. Absolutely, way more absolutely, people lose in that and scenario. as a result as a uh, community of people, shooting community, um, uh, that has a great propensity to impact on us because when we're going back to government to uh, lobby on issues or seek to um, you know, preserve our rights on certain things, actually if we're going back to them and saying, well, actually now the economic benefit is you know, about half of what it used to be and the conservation spend's about half of what it used to be, uh, you know, they're not their ears aren't pricked up as much by that. So it, it's not to say that it is a binary choice, but that is the potential. Yeah, it's issue. a really logical uh, way of going uh, around it, uh, as opposed equally, to losing out. Yeah, and equally, uh, what we are producing as a game shooting industry is a food product. Yeah, um, and there is a demand, and there is a growing demand, and we're seeing things. Uh, you know, the British Game Alliance at the moment they are opening up markets overseas, abroad. They're opening up internal markets, um, and actually, if there's ever a de demand there for it. If we have to change the way in which we shoot in order to fulfil that demand, yeah. we remain stronger in the long run. Yes, 100%. If we change how we shoot, because we don't want to change, so, sorry, if we change how we supply uh, that food product, mm -hmm. um, i.e. we reduce the amount just because we don't want to change the way that we shoot. It's just a stupid, stupid way of looking at it. So I'm trying I, to have this discussion with a few people. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's um, look, change is always difficult. Uh, and, I, and I don't And this is that. the first big change we've had in ammunition for, since nitro approving, 100 odd years ago. Yeah. yeah. No, more than 100 years ago. And yeah. since then it's been fairly, fairly stagnant, is that fair to say? Probably it's been fairly stagnant in the ammunition market, at least. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, the game, shooting scene has changed but that's by the by um sort of off the back of that is and it's not particularly linked but it, i suppose it is all linked is obviously world justice have just had an, another dig another jab yeah what is basque's response to that or what will be basque's response to that so um absolutely in the middle of getting that all together at the moment so strong uh, one would hope yeah no I'll, absolutely so wild justice uh are challenging game bird release on mm -hmm. the basis that um, the potential that has a likely significant effect on European designated sites and they are claiming it may have a, an effect on those sites all within five kilometres. So if you're releasing birds within, on those sites within five kilometres, what they are arguing is that it may have a significant effect on that European designation, that European designated site and the features of interest. And because of that, they are claiming that we need to then go through something called a habitats regulation assessment. Okay hugely involved, uh, quite costly, and um, what they're basically saying is that much like a large development is in proximity to one of these sites is that a release of game birds could be constituted a plan or a project. So even though potentially those game birds have been a lot there many years before. Uh, indeed, indeed. And one of the things they're challenging on is, is, is the, uh, you know, is the change in density. So are people and I think more? Has that got an impact? And does Basque have a stance on, on that? Or are you very much, I don't know, does Basque have a stance on density of release? Do you say best practice or nothing? Or are you kind of just ambiguous on the subject? Uh, no, we, absolutely. So Code of Good Shooting Practice, uh, which is something all the organisations are signed up to and Basque is signed up mm -hmm. to, has a uh, density of release, which is basically the level at which uh, stocking densities don't have any detrimental impact. Would you put that in law? Would you be happy if that was law? Uh, a, a very good question. I would prefer, as with all things that we do, that we have a self-regulation. Mm -hmm. um, because a legal regulation, A is burdensome, B is costly. Um, and actually, I and think it's put in place by someone else. And, and it's put in place by somebody else. And once you put that regulation in, it's very easy that then that gets changed, your densities drop, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, we would rather be guided by uh, evidence. And, you know, the, the current stocking densities are guided by really good evidence underpinned by research that GWCT and others have done. Um, so I don't necessarily think there's an issue there. In terms of what we're doing about the wild justice legal challenge, um, uh, we have sought legal opinion um you have your own legal team we we have a uh so we have we have gone out to um uh an environmental qc to get a legal okay. opinion on on the wild justice challenge so not only on uh game bird release Sorry. but also on um 
the general license issues as well. So we got some advice back from that and we are now considering what our position is and how we are going to tackle from a, from a legal stance point the particular challenges that they have made. But work is ongoing. We That sounds good, as long as work is ongoing and, uh, and with some speed, obviously. Uh, haste, absolutely, yeah. Haste. yeah. Um, going back to the, the, the magical steel debate, how long has this been on the table? How long have you guys known about it? How long have we known about it? I don't think we've known about it. it so, uh, no, how long has this decision been on the cards? Um, not a huge length of time, because the world, the world that we exist in... Um, months? Uh, years? Certainly not years. It is, a, it is a matter of months, and that is a... Uh, so it's a conscious decision by organisations, because they have a wide variety of factors that in order to preserve the future of shooting sports this is something that we need collectively as a community to do. Because it was quite a big turnaround from you guys being very much, I wouldn't say science led potentially, but I would say firm in your belief that unless there was more convincing science yep. on the detrimental impact of lead upon ourselves as a mm-hmm. health issue, and more importantly, wild, I say more importantly wildlife, on a balanced wildlife, yep that you guys were saying no and then i think this is why it was quite a big shock that you then came around and actually or you or yourself although obviously everyone's blaming you because you are the king of the organizations if you like uh, hundred and sixty thousand yeah. members yeah. or whatever versus yeah. country alliance probably second biggest with a 70 odd uh close to 100 i think but yeah, 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 yeah. so so yeah I, look we we naturally come in for some criticism whenever these things uh happen and occur but i i guess the way that I would view... Do you think you've handled it well? Let's go with that one. Um, I think there are there are multitude of ways to skin a cat, is yes. probably what I would say. Um, and I think you have to have some courage and your conviction in terms of the way that you deal with things. And I, personally, mm. my personal view is that the way that we went about it, because we are trying to coordinate across nine organisations with what is a fairly significant announcement is that in a very short done, period of time in a very short period saying. of time um that that needs to be done in a in is that a, was that any outside pressure inv- involved in this decision or why was it such a sudden thing uh, so I mean, it's not sudden is it you think you've given everyone five years to change their mind technically uh, and uh, eddie uh Somerset hunters eddie put it quite well as did, did we need a warm-up to the warm-up uh, uh, it's a good way of looking at it i guess yes i think so yeah. or at least yeah I, Difficult to say. I think everyone just feels betrayed, maybe? Told, uh, told off. People Confused. might be feeling like that, and certainly some Hurt. of the phone calls that I've got, that people are, are dissatisfied at the way that we went about it. I mean, the other thing to say is, and you, you raised the point about evidence, was that we shouldn't be thinking of evidence solely about the environmental and human health impacts of lead. Mm-hmm. We should be thinking about evidence in terms of how other countries are operating. We should be thinking about evidence of whether there are alternatives which are available on the market. Yeah. We should be thinking about evidence um, future proof in terms of what might be coming down the line from Europe. So yeah. we've got to think about all these things which are put into a big melting Making pot. yourself socially relevant. So single use plastic is a massive thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised you didn't go for that first years ago. Yeah, well, I think, I think there has been a um, progressive change and certainly we have always and there was a big campaign I think beginning of last season or certainly beginning of the year around moving to fibre wad um, for you know game shooting cartridges with with lead and and I think you know that's the the right way to go and let's reduce the amount of single use plastic Um, but it's difficult isn't it because we have got products which come on the market which you can have steel and you can have a biodegradable wad we've also got products that are there, existing bismuth, tungsten, those sorts of things, which are slightly softer, which you, you know, um, which you could use, but are, are they cost viable alternative? That's an interesting question, because if you actually do the sums, they're not, not hugely, so if we talk in terms of doing a, um, you know, firing 250 shells off, if you compare a slab of bismuth cartridges, which oh, might be about 300 quid. Um, yeah, 250, 300 pound, I would say, yeah. Um, compare that to a uh, sort of a, a good high-end game cartridge. What yeah, 100 quid, 110 quid. 110 yeah. quid, something like that. Actually, over the course of a day, comparative if you're firing that many shots what's the cost of the day been actually is that in a huge only on the basis of pheasant shooting i think yeah. so oh, the, the pheasant boys have 
I would have thought less of an argument on their hands, or at least it's a more easy, it's an easier conversation to have, isn't it? If you're spending a large amount of money to shoot pheasants, a small amount of money on cartridges just doesn't make a lot of difference. Let's say you go on a a large day where you fire a slab, that large day's cost you a couple of grand anyway. Spending a little bit more doesn't make too much of a difference. And I obviously understand that that is maybe not the case. Some people are stretching to get to that, yep. but it shoots like less pheasants and less cartridge, and the cartridge bill will make up for it. So that's an understandable thing. Where it really hits home is the, the pigeon shooters, I yep. think, at the lower end of the market. And one of the questions I got is, do you have some kind of plan or project in place to potentially work with cartridge manufacturers to regulate the price of steel ammo to try and help bring that down? Will this be a communal move forward? Is that in your plan to try and keep accessibility <coughs> high? Uh, I think we would struggle, as with any industry, to regulate the price of something because mm -hmm. the price is determined by market factors, yeah. um, and those being, you know, market factors in terms of raw material costs as well as the sort of the, the getting them out the outlets and, and selling them the profit margin, etc. So, um, no, but I think probably where we are able to come in is is to support cartridge manufacturers is to go to government is to get the um you know to, to try and secure funding to support research and development to improve availability viability new types of cartridge coming to market and there are so we've got a couple of manufacturers who are producing steel cartridges with a biodegradable wad we've got a new manufacturer just they, coming on to but the they're scene. more money this is what yeah, yeah they are they are yeah. but but equally uh would you see this as maybe a just a change in the amount that people shoot do you think that's a bad thing or a good thing I, I would i would never want to go down the line of restricting the amount that people shoot because i think you know uh if you think pigeons for example you, why would we want to reduce yes. the amount of people shooting well, pigeons you, you, need, you need to shoot a lot precisely um but again i, I mean I, I don't know Ely Eco Wards, what are you retailing those for? No, there are. Uh, I think if you buy them individually in 250, they're about 110, 115 pounds a thousand. If you yep. buy by the thousand, they're about 95 quid. 95 quid. So in the realms of a sort of top end. They are a very top end game shell. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And a very, yeah, they're a top end game shell. Yeah. Whereas, you know, uh, Clear Pigeon, for example, is what about 70 quid a slab to yeah. that, or two, 250 quid a thousand yeah. yeah it's a much more reasonable yeah, yeah. price point yeah but again look at the difference in cost i think so, uh, so my yeah. personal opinion on this is very much more of a a social change i think i remember starting pigeon shooting as a kid and the estate and the farmer would sort your shells because actually you're doing them this big favor yeah, yeah. and perhaps maybe there's a, a a swing if you are indeed doing that good a job for them that they might help subsidise. Uh, and yeah, and the other thing to bring into that is that if we look at something like pigeons, yes, the cartridges are more expensive, but there are game dealers who will pay a premium for pigeons shot with steel. Agreed. There's a bit much bigger market for anything shot with steel. So, which is yeah, great. Yeah. So, so the, one would hope that they'll. Yeah. I think it's just a wider social change, and people struggle with that yeah. because yeah. it's been the same for quite a while. I know, and I, look, as with any change. Uh, uh, any move which elicits change is going to have people who adopt change early. There are going to be people who are adverse to change and there are going to be people who have a concern about how that change affects them and whether they are willing to partake in it. The, the good thing about a voluntary transition is precisely that, and we discussed it at the start, it is voluntary. This is not, um, you know, your customers aren't gonna come in here tomorrow and go, Johnny, where's all your lead gone? You'd um, be surprised how many people have made a positive and conscious move over the course of this week, gone from angry to, can I try some steel out? Yeah, but good to hear. Yeah. Good to hear, yeah. Or maybe you're not surprised. Maybe that was kind of part uh, and parcel of what you guys were trying to achieve, I presume, is to start a social change. Well, I, I think somebody has got to take that step. Mm -hmm. And certainly what we've seen playing out on social media is that there is an unpopularity about the step that has been taken. And I think the good thing uh, in terms of the way that the organisations have worked together is that we've all taken that step together yeah. and we're hoping that over time the shooting community will. So there are people that I've already seen that are saying, great, brilliant. Um, indeed, there are people on the other side going, just, you know, don't want it to happen. It can't happen. Um, there are even people that are saying that we haven't gone far enough as organisations. When you say far not far enough, I mean, what were they hoping? Uh, ban shooting no, no just to, to see so there were there Personal are people who limits. are calling calling to see a legislative change around lead and plastic 
I think there should be a legislative change about plastic when the time is right and we do have a viable alternative uh, in place. And I think the five year transition period allows it's time to start enough, looking right? at some Look of at what technology was like five years ago, where we are now. What can change in five years with the right mental attitude so, is vast. So, somebody's got to take the first step. Um, and it's a chicken and egg scenario, isn't it? Agreed, mate. Um, so, we'll work through a couple of these quickly. Yep. Uh, what if a gun won't take steel, was asked. Um, what if a gun won't take steel? So, uh, first thing to say is I've had quite a few calls and <clears throat> quite a few emails into my office saying, uh, this is my gun, it won't take steel, what am I going to do? Yep. Um, first question is, is it nitro-proof? If it's nitro proof, it will take standard steel. Um, it, but uh, again, you have to be mindful of chokes. But certainly, the CIP advice is that if your gun is nitro proof, it can take standard steel cartridges as long as your chamber length is, is you know, using the right chamber length cartridge. And we'll come on to that in a second. Um, but your shot size needs to be 3.25 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And there is some discrepancy between lead is sized in one size, steel yeah, is sized in another a size. a lead shot size four, lead and shot a size steel four. shot size three. Uh, other way around. Uh, lead shot size three, steel shot size four. Yeah. Mm, no. Well, how does Ely get away with making an eco one three? I think it might be sized, and this is because it is a 3.25 millimeter, which is why shot is always just a bit of a bollock anyway, because every country has a different size and it's all a lie. Yeah. And if you open yeah. up a cartridge properly and have a look, that the variance is probably actually yeah. plus or minus one uh, uh, shot size. I think that probably comes. Ah. It, it probably comes around from so the the standing advice around steel shot is you go two shot sizes down. So if you're using a lead number five. Mm. You would move to a lead number three. A steel number three, yeah. Uh, but that's equal to a steel number four, but it's the same size, it's 3.25 millimeters. So, yeah. Well, great. And I'm glad because that is equally as confusing as it seemed when I read up on it, that actually <laughs> none of it makes a difference. However, I am also aware that CIP actually allows you up to four millimeters, which is a technical just shy of a BB, but 3.25 is the solid advice across the board. Solid advice, so you don't have to change your. So that will go through any choke. Yes. Uh, but there is. So that. It's really complicated. Uh, however, I believe the basket advice also says that it may risk bulging, but that's not your problem. Anyway, um, we'll move off of that because actually okay. we did a video on it and you go check that out if anyone's yeah. actually interested, uh, Great. just to help you out. Um, what are the full chokers going to do after 2024? What are the full chokers going to do after 2024? I should interject here and say that all new Paratsis, Longforms, Fab Arms, uh, the new breeder zenith, all full choke, fixed chokes are steel proofed and have been for like a year now. So, uh, so it's only old. What are old full chokers going to do after twenty twenty four? That probably answers part of the question. Is that part of having a transition period? One may need to is there upgrade. Things are developed. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that you, you elect to upgrade, but actually what you might see is that there is a new product that comes on the market that might be available. Quite possibly. So, you know, and those are the things we've got to think about. So, uh, as it stands at the moment, yeah, it might be quite difficult because we haven't got the availability, but uh, in five years' time it might be quite different. Uh, uh, yes, you, the, hopefully so. Or for currently, if you want to remove right now, have it take, have the choke taken out, shoot bismuth or tungsten, or don't shoot full choke with those things. We'll yeah. shoot lead because it's voluntary. Because yeah, it's voluntary. Take a pick. So, uh, yeah. um, which, what is this? How will this be policed? One of thought, you're not going to police it because it's voluntary. I'm not going to police it because it's absolutely voluntary. Yeah. Right. So this is a hearts and minds thing as opposed to a law it, and letter thing. It, it is saying to people, <coughs> look, we... This is potentially the future. This is the future. We, we need to get ourselves ready for it. My concern would be if we don't take this move and if we don't move voluntarily as a community to make steps towards moving away from lead and moving away from single use plastic is that we reach a point whereby legislation from Europe is imposed mm -hmm. that our government take a decision to take that into UK law and we as a shooting community are Within absolutely month, left bollocks high and dry. zero innovation. This is about getting and then people us really would be unhappy, wouldn't situation. they? They they <laughs> would, but equally, because this is probably one of the areas whereby um, lead is lead is a heavy metal. It does That's have quite good. It does have toxicity effects. Um, so 
if we are putting that out into a uh, into the wider environment, there are impacts. Uh, the I, evidence I, I, sits there with impacts. I, I think, aside from what you say, um, well, I'm here to talk, but you are. But <laughs> my my thoughts would be very much in lines is about keeping ourselves socially relevant. <laughs> to be seen to be throwing plastic into the environment is a knobhead's thing to do, and to be seen to be th- putting lead out into the environment for somebody, even though some of the evidence is ambiguous. Although I would have thought if actually it was looked into properly, I think people may be a bit more scared or a bit quicker to change. Um, that you just can't get away with it. Everything has to measure up to the year that you're in. And we don't particularly measure up with our current methods to the world if they were to look at us. And that keeping ourselves relevant is also going to keep us mildly popular, even though people go, oh, people hate us anyway. They don't have to. Uh, we should be working towards uh, the not hate. Absolutely, and, and, and public opinion sways government policy. Um, yes, uh, and, uh, really. and ultimately, if we are looking at Europe having a stance whereby they are seeking to make probably overtly restrictive legislative changes, mm-hmm. is it not better that as a community we have taken an approach to self-regulation in one of the areas of concern, which is about the wider environment, putting lead and single-use plastic out into the wider environment? So if we can make a change in that direction for that particular asset, there are a number of areas where we are perhaps more concerned about the alternatives to lead, those being rifle ammunition, because um, once you drop below 6.5 millimeter, certainly the rimfire rounds, um, having viable good alternatives are not currently there on the market. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, they are being they worked upon. They're being worked. They're upon. being worked upon, but uh, they're not there at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, equally, you have. You know, clay grounds and enclosed environments. Uh, with, with one of the questions here yep. is, what is the future of lead shot for clays? So, uh, I presume you have no intentions of doing that and would defend lead shooting for clays because... Absolutely, so you are, you are in effect... Um, until the Olympic op- standard becomes steel only. Operating in an enclosed environment, whereby as part of the uh, planning in, ha- in terms of how those sites are, are operated, if lead is being put into environment in that quantity, there is some sort of mediation to prevent mm-hmm. there being any sort of toxic leachate. Equally, there are some grounds who will recover the shot. I know it's an expensive process. Um, we usually pays off, shot. from what I understand. So but equally, um, you know, if they're firing the money, so. uh, lead with plastic wads, which is you know popular in terms of the, the clay shooting scene, then those plastic wads can be recovered and recycled. Mm, even so, though most fiber wad performances now are so damn good. Very, very good. Yeah, very, very good. So, uh, and I guess the only point that sort of then adds on to that is that equally, um, you know, if you're clay shooting in a let's term it a green field environment maybe we need to think a locally about, straw bale affair we need to think about in terms of uh where you're going to position yourself in the future in terms of the use of lead and use of single yes, per, maybe perhaps so plastic wadded ammunition for shotguns you are not going after going after you're not looking for a change there in clay shooting no okay cool i thought that was quite unclear um well, i would have thought that maybe you would have gone for that as well uh, but that is not so, my... No, I mean, ultimately, what the organisations have done is, is, and it's about calculating where the impacts and where we are likely to see an impact, um, and that is certainly around the live quarry shooting piece and the wider open free environment, um, and because of the legislative changes. So what we are hoping is that by adopting this change in leadership, actually, because legislation and regulation and enforcement is very costly, mm-hmm. the government will look and say, Actually, these guys have got a grip of this as a community. Yeah, we don't need to. We don't need to do anything else. So, your clay shooters, your rifle shooters, and where we have no viable alternatives at this point in time, actually remain safe. And because because to lose clay shooting, to lose target rifle shooting, to huge impact, absolutely huge impact. So. This is a, uh, a move to, to sort of seek the so alternatives. So one of the market. questions is, what does the future look like for gun ownership because of this in bass size? And I think from what you just said is you're still looking to maintain it. You're really looking to safeguard game shooting, which is clearly what this is about, or is clearly what it's about to me anyway. Tr- trying to safeguard shooting in its entirety, yeah. Okay. So we're gonna take us over right back to the beginning. And most of the people's issues with this is the way that Basque handed it out. And we kind of spoke about it before for, and and you have said that you don't regret the way it was handled or anything like that. That really does surprise me. Do you think Basque would do the same again? Uh, I, or I, have you, you learnt a lesson? In I, so I think 
PR. <laughs> yeah, I think I think ultimately, um, you know. Uh, or you don't care because no, no, people forget about it. No pl- well, no, no plan to buy sort of uh, first contact. So I'm sure there are learning points that we would take away and and, and would change how things have been done. Um, but again, I sort of come back to the piece that this this was across organisations and it had to be done in a coordinated way. And I don't think that it being leaked out or pushed out in a gradual fashion. So there has been some great work which has gone into this, and you know we've been running sort of articles in terms of. Um, in the Bass magazine, I, we've been putting stuff out uh, online, but equally, it, but it's I th- not been. Do you not think it would be wiser to go through and like utilize the popular media that's already out there? It's. It really, I mean, it genuinely surprised me that you know Andy Crow hasn't been shooting all of his pigeons with steel this last however many months you have known. Um, like it surprised me you haven't taken that as a really easy and obvious a- avenue to promote because it's when it is propaganda 101 isn't it well I, so and I, and I think because we are we are we are not sort of because there isn't a ban and because we are not saying to people that you've got to change overnight i think now we've got five years to start so people this start is the beginning of your easing this, this is this is the beginning of saying so to people the start thinking about yeah, this way the statement of, wasn't as scary as it came across no. So I think maybe that would be, in fact, where the mistake was made, perhaps, is that it came across very scary. Is that because that was the way that the statement was uh, prepared, or do you think that is because naturally, at the start of any change, it's, a big, it's, scary to it's a big stone wall, isn't it? And it's a case of you kind of just threw it up in front of people as opposed to just maybe over the course or, or, or a simple statement a couple of weeks before going. Guys, this is on the cards. I think we'd have still got a, a, an adverse reaction in some quarters. I think we'd have oh, still got a reaction in other so. quarters. Um, so I, it's about minimising hatred, right, <laughs> at the end is, of the day. Is, but from what you say, you actually haven't had a negative reaction other than some very noisy people on Facebook. Social media has absolutely stirred uh, some quite negative reaction in terms of the sort of the, the calls that we're getting into our um, regional offices and, and HQ teams. Uh, I would say there is a split. Um, there are certainly people who uh, who feel that this is the wrong way to go, and therefore, you know that that is how they hold this. It's yeah, the wrong way fine. to go. We shouldn't yeah. be doing it. Equally, there are people, and, and there is no um, sort of even going through the sort of motion of explaining where we are, why we've done it, and much of what we've just discussed now. Um, that they their view isn't changed, or they don't see. Uh, the necessity of moving away from lead shot. Equally, there are those people that start off on that foot, but actually, by the time that we've gone through a more in-depth explanation of the reasons, the rationale, actually, they're accepting that it's probably the right thing to do. And look, let's look over the next five years and see where it goes. Um, and equally, uh, as I said earlier, we have had people that have phoned up and said, "Look, I don't think you've gone far enough." Okay. So, what's the next? What is the plan for the next five years? In that case, I mean, this is kind of the thing. If this is just you guys saying, "This is the plan." Yep. What's the plan? Or is, you know, this this sort of gradual phase out, or is it just a case of, is it just words that we're gradually hoping that people don't do it? Or in your head, is it a case of, will you guys be doing something to help this change? Absolutely. So what? It's, so we've got a bit of a chicken and egg situation going on. Um, and where we need to get to um, is a move away from lead and a move away from single-use plastic because of the legislative impacts and all the rest and the things that we've explained and yeah. talked about earlier in the video. Um, how do we support getting there? Well, somebody's obviously got to make the first step. Um, some of the cartridge manufacturers have made a step in terms of producing the steel and producing the uh, biodegradable wad ammunition. So there's a step. Equally, we have come out as a collective series of organisations to say, this is the way we think that we should be going. So. Almost, we've now got the egg, so we need to start growing the chicken. Um, and getting into a situation whereby, so there are a number of things that we can do. We can support the ammunition manufacturers in terms of uh, lobbying, looking to secure funding for research and development. Because we've taken this step in terms of the chicken and the egg piece, actually we're saying to people, this is where we might want to end up and how do we get there, um, that people will take that on. There'll be people who early adopt it. So they will be taking on part of this um, change in terms of the technology that they're using steel or bismuth or tungsten and you know biodegradable wads. So they will start to use it. So these adopters start to use it. That grows market demand and hopefully that also then feeds back into 
if we can secure some support for manufacturers in terms of developing new stuff. The market demand helps to generate that demand for them to develop the new stuff. So, so your job, I presume, is to win more hearts and minds to divert the money into the development. Yes, partially, but also, you know, part of my role at Bass is I oversee the sort of the, the regional forward-facing operations. So this is the delivering of, uh, you know, member engagement on the front line, community engagement on the front line. So training courses, advice sessions, members evenings where this will be sort of a core topic so that people can come in, they can ask questions, they can see how they might be able to for their particular Do you guys have a research department? We do have a research department, yeah. What do they do? So they... Will they be involved in this kind of leady steely kind of thing? Absolutely, and and they already are in terms of uh, the sort of the background research, the background science behind some of these moves, but equally they are there in terms of our research department and they are looking at things like the scientific evidence underpinning the need for general licences, the scientific evidence underpinning the I'm sure working impacts. very closely with the Game so, Wildlife Conservation Trust and, and the like. So yeah. there is a whole gambit of stuff that they will basically identify and underpin with the sort of scientific basis that we can then make policy yeah. decisions and et cetera, et cetera, or support um, moves against attacks on shooting like we're seeing from Wild Justice. So actually it's, they are there to research and generate the science. Are they there to uh, help develop new ammunition technologies? No, because they don't have the, um, the specialism in that, but certainly in terms of where we can go in terms of trying to help the manufacturers secure government support um, okay. or other support or funding from elsewhere, then, then we will absolutely do what we can to try and facilitate that because it's important in terms of the future of shooting. Um, and let's not forget, we've got nine organisations that have come together. It's not just your fault. It's not just bad. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, we've got <laughs> nine organisations who have come together because based on the available evidence and based on the looming issues that there are in Europe and based on the current developments in technology, in order to secure a long-term future for shooting, mm -hmm. this is where we feel we need to go as a community. Um, and I think ultimately that is the shooting community who join membership organisations require them to uh, seek to find ways to ensure that shooting yeah. is sustainable in the long term and that you know your kids my kids you're not just sat, sat there going no nope, we're never changing like some organizations so that, and, and, but the, the other point of this is is that far too long organizations have been reactionary mm -hmm. And actually, part of what people complained about that too, by the way, to do is is about being proactive. Yeah. So you are getting in front of the curve of this. You've got, you, you, we've got to change the way and our footing because we've got to analyse the types of threats that we might. And we're not we're not always going to catch them because things will come completely. Mm -hmm. We saw that with the general licences last year, um, you know. And, and I think we're just trying to make sure that the shooting community is proactive and that we yeah. are seem to be progressive and actually underpinning what we're doing on a basis of trying to secure the future of shooting in yes. the long term. Making our bite as good as our bark or bark. Yeah, making our bite as good as our bark. Whatever you know, know, we, yeah. we, we speak a great game. We're great conservationists, but potentially there is holes in that. It's about closing those holes around. And going back to what you just said about general licenses, what's crack with them at the moment? Obviously we've had an extension, so which is really nice. At least gets us to a time of year where it's actually very important with no arguing and bun fighting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, two sort of key points to make on that. Mm -hmm. We did a, a huge amount of engagement with the government, with the ministers, with uh, DEFRA, who the parliament. They, they listened to you? Good. Uh, we've got an extension of licenses for six months. This is because, so, because, because of the it's fact not six years though, but six months is better than that. But yeah. ultimately, it was better than coming to termination at the end of February. Yes, a hundred percent, and then, and then the not same, having nothing for two months again. Yeah, yeah. precisely. So, um, lobbying, talking sense, going through what the issues are in terms of, you know, if they withdraw these licenses at that particular point in time, what the sensitivities are, and coming to a position whereby. Do you know what? You did a consultation. They had four thousand responses, I believe. Is that it? Uh, would have liked to have seen more, but equally, hopefully, that gives them ample evidence on which to start making decisions around license purpose species that they will put on it. Because a lot of this stuff, there isn't the scientific 
you know, registered papers, no. peer-reviewed papers. So actually the practitioner evidence is really important, yeah. really, really important. Um, and because of the timescales that had elapsed, basically our point to them was, well, you've had all these responses, you need to do something with it. So instead of terminating these licenses and coming out with something which actually probably isn't going to be fit for purpose, because A, you haven't had time to analyse all of those 4,000 responses, and B, you've not undertaken your stakeholder engagement, which you need to do. Um, let's give you some more time to consider those things. Mm -hmm. Let's ensure the stakeholder engagement happens, and let's work with you so that when in August, if that's the six month period, that we're looking to issue new licenses, let's get them right, and let's get them fit for purpose. Okay. The other thing that we are equally perturbed by uh, is this issue around control over European sites and within a 300 metre buffer. Yes. So, so you're going to try and hope, what, limit that, withdraw that, uh, or is that not negotiable? Uh, we we don't see that there is a... Um, Any reason to have magpies on there and not on the ground next now, to it? underpinning not allowing that control and on the flip side so if you have got world justice who are exercised about that particular issue in terms of european sites features of interest etc etc the flip side of that coin is if you are not permitting control on those sites and within 300 meters are you upholding your statutory duty to protect the features for which that site has been designated and do you have the evidence to show us that you are protecting those breeding birds for which some of those sites are designated? Are you protecting the features of interest for which, um, uh, you know, there might be a feature which, for example, Canada geese are impacting on um, because of the way that they feed and graze and trample, etc. Yes. So there, there are a huge range of Unfortunately, things. Unfortunately, they're not brave enough, any of these organisations, to come out and say, we need to kill shit to protect other things. Um, so there we is a, there are is two a sides. large impactor on the ground, and I just would love it if I don't know. It's, uh, we do a bit. Lots of people do a little bit. If everyone did a little bit more, and up to and include someone like RSP, we said actually, you know what, guys, we do need to control Canada geese numbers on here because of X, Y, and Z. And if you don't like it, that's conservation. But no, no well, maybe they'll come out and say that. You never know. Uh, but I, we can dream. I think there is a. There is a valid argument there in terms of well, if there are features of of interest which yeah. um, we are unable to protect because these are protected sites. <laughs> um, if we're not able to protect those features, are you as a government? And those features we're talking people? about flora and fauna. Flora and fauna. Well, they can be flora and fauna. They can be geological features, but equally, predominantly flora and fauna. And mm -hmm. there may be so. Um, I undertake some kind of control on a site whereby uh, last year I had to apply for an individual license because. Canada geese, Egyptian geese were destroying, trampling, grazing off um, some nationally important plant species. Yes, which is, and there was no way they, to keep they, them away. They don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and equally, if we are unable to take that, undertake that control in a sensible, measured way, which is the way that the general license is allowed to operate, <laughs> um, the, I mean, are they protecting those features of interest? Do you feel like a? Um, do you feel like any? Uh, that's not a question you're going to answer. But I was going to say, is there? Do you feel like any further restriction would not necessarily be a bad thing? Do you think a national register, perhaps run by Basque, of, let's say, I would say, kill, uh, kill vermin control returns? I, so you're talking about a bad bag recording? Um, yes. Uh, I, so my personal view is I don't see the benefit. Okay. Because what does it tell you? Uh, uh, because what it tells you is I have killed 80 magpies a year for the last 50 years. It won't make a difference. I carry on doing it, but it will make a difference to everything else if I don't stop. So, so my view would be there are already breeding bird, wetland bird censuses, mm -hmm. which give us a population estimate of um, species. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, what we should be more concerned about is the conservation status of species that are threatened, um, and the fact that I've shot eighteen magpies doesn't impact on the conservation status of magpies. It does if there was only 18 there. But, I'm but not going to say, I'm just playing devil so, out so, here, so, but if, if we have a, a breeding bird census that tells us there are, I don't know, X number of 100,000 magpies in the country, mm -hmm. actually the fact that, that next year when they do the survey, there are still X number of thousand, actually the, the impact that we are having okay. is... So I think 
to my view is let's turn it on its head actually there is an existing uh, scenario in place whereby we are monitoring or not we that organizations are monitoring these bird species numbers mm -hmm. voluntarily so BTO or FPV those sorts of things um, and actually we can monitor the population trends and for this pest species that we are talking about um, it, it, the population trends are not being impacted by yeah. hunt. Um, I wouldn't uh, have thought they active. were anyway. So, yeah, interesting, interesting way to look at it. Uh, do we need to add more burden into probably an already fairly um, burdensome, bu burdensome and bureaucratic process, which seems to have come slightly more burdensome and bureaucratic. Uh, I mean, I only put it from a, a perspective of wouldn't it be nice if everyone truly understood the reason behind why they do things, although that's just me being more facetious on the subject than anything else. Wouldn't it be nice if when someone's out shooting crows, what you're shooting them for, I'm shooting them to protect those birds over there nesting in that hedge. I've had 52 the last two years, blah, 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 and people taking responsibility for the knowledge of their own ground, making everyone a little micro-conservationist. But I realise that's also unrealistic. I, so, so, but that's like, that's just, I don't know, again, yeah, I, no, I, there's I, a dream. I get, I, get what you're, I get what you're saying, but my view would be is that I think people are... Um, it's a bigger picture than just they, mate, they we're looking aware. after yeah. his 10 acres. So, and again, the other thing that, uh, particularly the way that you look at general licenses is actually that these are operating at a landscape scale. They are very much so. so and I, I think the way that they are currently works perfectly well, I should point out. I'm just, you know... Yeah, and I, and I think actually bollocks, let's, really. let's try and get to a position whereby we've got a really good workable license. And if they are so requiring us to think about the impacts on uh, designated sites, European sites, because of the control that happens or the control within 300 metres, actually let's get some really simple workable general licences which are applicable to those different types of sites and habitat, so that if I need to go and do that control, actually it's underpinned by if they need it habitat. One would have thought that these European sites anyway have a lot of surveys that potentially would back you up scientifically to go and do the control, yeah. so perhaps that shouldn't be an issue anyway. It, it, part of the course of action that we are reviewing into, and it, again, this comes in. You asked me about the research team, and actually, this is part and part of, of what they are there to do to, to get the underpinning research to look at the arguments in terms of. Let's go. Actually, it's probably more important that we do use the general license right next to your land uh, than not, because you're trying to preserve X. And, it, and it's it's key principles of conservation, isn't it? It's it's um, uh, habitat availability to live in its food source availability to feed on and then it's also control of predators um, yes. and that's where in an environment is that is not entirely natural yeah anyway um is there anything you'd like to conclude on um other than everyone thinks you made a mistake you guys don't think you do and i would have thought actually in reality in a couple of weeks time everyone would have calmed down i do feel like Again, I'll reiterate that perhaps if it, it was just you state, uh, stating that we think that we need to change the steel, it should have been done softer. But I suppose everyone's going to hate you regardless of what you said. So, <laughs> hate's a very strong word, isn't it? Oh, um, I've seen some. I've definitely received hate for what I said about it. So, yeah, <laughs> hate. There is a lot of hate out there, mate. Yeah, that's I, I, I know, and, it, and and it's disappointing within um, within the community because actually. You don't have to be nice to shoot. The all, yeah, but, it's but become very evident. But ultimately, what we should be doing is that we should be getting or working together, uh, actually, to try and secure the future of shooting because that's what mm -hmm. we're all interested in. Yes, um, I agree. And I do realise that in some quarters this is going to be a, a an unpopular decision. But and I, actually, that's the only last question I have: is how do you think high bird trend will be impacted? Given that that is probably one of the quarters that dislikes this the most um a number of things to say on that front is I that will listen the beauty about this being voluntary is that if if we don't think if they don't think that at this point in time there is a suitable viable alternative well they continue to use what they've got until there is a viable alternative put into the frame the alternatives are um we change the way in which we shoot so do I think that if you uh, I'm not saying that I would want to try it but you know um, uh, an over and under chambered with three inch chambers uh, with wad stripping chokes in and you could put three inch you know three inch three loads through it uh, steel admittedly they will have a plastic wad in yeah. but you can move away from the leg piece but I'm not suggesting that is there a may well option. come a point that there is a non-plastic 
Yeah, Obviously but, but there's, I guess, three, there's three and a half inch over and unders as well, aren't there? What, but what I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are options that could be investigated. I don't necessarily think at this point in time that they are realistic and that no. people aren't going to be sort of running and jumping well, over Well, you to. don't think there's going to be 10 blokes stood in a line with three and a half inch Magnum semi-automatic <sighs> double gun in no, batting high birds? I, I don't think no, so. That's not going to no, change tomorrow, I don't tomorrow, think so. Um, uh, but equally Maybe so, in 40 years time. It, it, it's about, and I think we touched on this at the beginning, didn't we? It's about that there is a, um, uh, it, it's a change and a change in the way that we do things. Um, and if there aren't viable alternatives at this point in time, well, you know, you stick with what works until such a time that something comes in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, we, we, I don't know if we've touched uh, in in this conversation. We did before we started about the CIP regs and Basque will be pushing to open those up. So certainly part of what we would want to do is look at the regulations around uh, proof and in terms of the pressures and the uh, steel loads for which guns are In, in simple for. terms, that means faster cartridges, more death. <laughs> so faster cartridges, and you only have to look at some of the, um, uh, you know, American um, yeah. stuff that is Swedish being used, stuff. Yeah, Swedish some stuff. really powerful, cool stuff out there. That really, we're not allowed to use really good ammunition, which we don't have. It. So you know, I shoot a um, uh, three and a half inch um, Benelli, and you know, whilst it's proof to CIP proof, there is absolutely no reason why I couldn't put some of that stuff through it because yes, because it Americans do it and their guns are fine. Yeah, and it, and it's just essentially the same gun, but. From a legal standpoint, it isn't proofed to do it. Yes. So, um, and I think that's that's part and parcel of what we've got to do is look at in terms of getting those viable alternatives. That is one of the steps we have to yeah. go through is looking at the, um, the the proof and whether there's a need to change proof regulations, particularly in relation to steel. And I don't know. You, you used the term earlier, sort of super super. Um, yes, a third proof option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I would think that is. Well, no, I think that should be priority number one if you want to convince people. Does, does steel kill well? No, yes. No. Really? <laughs> so uh, it's interesting. So I, as a wildfire, I use steel frequently. For the last 20 um, odd years, I would have thought. Yeah, well, you know, I, I use steel, I use business, I use steel, and, you know, I ultimately use steel uh, for everything that I shoot in terms of, of, of wild fouling. Um Do you not use it for your pheasants? I do on occasions, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I do on occasions. Uh, okay, I thought, do you find they shoot differently? Or are you not good enough to tell? <laughs> do I find Sorry. they shoot differently? Um, yeah. I can't say that I've noticed a particular difference in terms of. Um, not, I'm never going to claim to be some of that, you know, yeah. a particularly good shot. But I, I no, I don't. I, my view is, um, I miss just as many as lead as I do with steel. I kill just yeah. as many as I do with steel and lead. Um, good way of looking at it. Uh, and that's the way that I would look at it. And yeah, I've I've used steel on. On pheasants, when I go out on on shoots, from you know, if we're in a particular area, where we might over wetlands marshes, duck and wetlands yeah. marshes, yeah, I'm opportunity ready. of duck, yeah. So yeah, and I, so I'm 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 content with using steel personally, and I, but I don't shoot in a number of situations whereby people might be saying, well, actually, for me, as somebody who shoots high pheasants, at the moment there isn't an option that I can go to, and therefore this is the part of the voluntary pieces yes. that you not until Basque open up CIP proof and allow us to shoot two and a half thousand feet per second cartridges. Yeah. Four inch magnum. <laughs> Develop the four inch magnum. The four inch magnum. I like it. So, yeah, yeah. Bring back ten bore. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, so there's options out there. Hundred percent. There's there's plenty of options out there for those who do want to shoot high pheasants with steel. There is options out there, just not without plastic wads at the moment. At this point in time. At this point in time. But, you know, yeah. hopefully we can secure as the um, as time goes on. Hopefully we can secure uh, Mate, new products. Coming I love a good market. bit of innovation. Same as next man. So let's hope the future is bright. Um, We've covered just about everything I could ever want to cover. Is there anything else that we should know that's going to come out later this year? <laughs> <laughs> um, not, not to my knowledge. Uh, so I think um, you know uh, the horizon pieces for the organisation at this point in time are certainly um, general licences, mm -hmm. big thing. We're working on that, working on that hard in terms of sort of government interaction, interaction with Defra. The Wild Justice Legal Challenge, which they have now gone in to uh, seek judicial review, mm -hmm. so register as an interested party so we can get all of their legal arguments, legal paperwork coming through. Um, we can equally submit our own evidence as part of that, so we're going to, you know, we're fighting that hard and across the organisations they're fighting that hard. Trophy hunting, regulations, con consultation, so the consultation well, around that's that. That's gone quiet, hasn't it? Uh, so we've now submitted, as an organisation, we've submitted our response to that. Uh, 
which was along the lines of basically there is there are existing uh, measures through CITES so so CITES pretty much cover what they're worried the about the CITES yeah. it covers what they're worried about actually any more restrictive regulation has unintended consequences so you know let's both domestically and abroad. domestically and yeah, abroad. Yeah. So domestically being I presume your key priority absolutely so well if, well both because I think we are there to represent all shooters but certainly in terms of the uh, domestic situation if we had a a raft of legislation around trophy it paper, would put which, deer which, back to pest species status which was not good for them 50 years ago well, well would, less than that 30 years ago would it would it do that or would it actually just mean that actually it, it made the culling of deer impossible that, so that so we've got to think about what the un- unintended consequences. Well, no, venison's still worth money, isn't it? It Culling, is still worth yeah. money, but how do you define a trophy? Well, they're never going to say you can't shoot that. Uh, but but venison's so, a trophy. No, one hundred percent. Our big concern is is that you know we do have an awful lot of European uh, people, who, you know, hunters who come into the country, roam. Uh, rent, it's those sorts good of business, things. and more importantly, it's damn good for deer population. Uh, absolutely, good, damn you know, good for conservation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's deer having value in deer means there's value in yeah. the the what feeds the deer, which has value and repercussions across the course. So I mean, so those horizon pieces, those things we're working on, obviously, uh, lead transition, single use plastics is is another big thing which we've we've sort of talked around. So it's going to be a busy year, mate. Yeah, it's a busy year, very very busy year. I'm going to end with a real tough one, and of course you're going to answer it in the most patriotic way, too, Bass. <laughs> Do you think Basque do a good enough job of promoting the sport? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I only have to look at the work that my guys do uh, across the regions in terms of the way that they engage with people. So we are not only engaging with um, uh, the shooting community, so that is about people who already shoot, so it's about instilling best practice, providing advice, looking at new disciplines that they might want to get into. It's also about uh, um, returning people into shooting. So you get some people who will come in in their younger years, they then go off because they get distracted by other things, cars, the opposite sex, all those sorts of things that, you know, that that, that impact um, uh, once you get say, being distracted years. by having no money in your early 20s well, is and, and, then, one, and then having no money but then returning in their sort of 30s actually and, and actually reactivating people in so that's yep. another part of it um, and recruiting new people in that people are showing an interest and bringing them into the sport uh, completely new so there's one angle to it the other angle is it's the public engagement which we are really really focused on which is about saying to the general public here is what we do mm-hmm. here is how we do it here is what the benefits are Benefits in terms of food security, pest control, benefits in terms of conservation work, benefits in terms of economy, benefits in terms of people's social well-being. There's a huge amount of stuff that we can get out there and we can tell the general public. So, again, touched on this point earlier, uh, public perception is what governs government decision making. Um, And actually, if the general public think that we are a pretty stand-up bunch of people, or actually don't care what we do, but when they come to see it under scrutiny actually we're transparent about the things that we do and how we yeah. go about it it's relevant so, and stands up to such thing yeah is it is it relevant in today's society and that's you know the the question that you pose me and it's about demonstrating that yeah we are we are relevant because um here are all the things that we do to the benefit of the environment that you enjoy as much as we do but you yeah. enjoy it for different reasons right this has been enlightening hopefully for everyone on here i was kind of hoping you'd be like crying go we're so sorry <laughs> I'm sorry for breaking all of your hearts. Uh, um, yeah, but it's it's clear to me that actually maybe in the long term, short term decision making was probably piss poor. But I think by the time in a couple of weeks' time, people will start to get over this. The information will start to filter out, and people may start to calm down. And I think that big thing at the beginning that you said about this being voluntary, you don't have to do it. Yeah. But you're probably by the time this comes to a close, going to be viewed as a bit of a knob if you don't. Might be quite good. Right, thank you very much.